Good morning, Bucknutters. Welcome to the Bucknuts Morning 5 here on Friday, November 20th, 2020. I am Dave Biddle. I am very happy to be joined by Jonah Booker for his usual Friday visit. And what a great Friday visit it is. Not only do we have a game tomorrow, a top 10 matchup with the Buckeyes and Hoosiers, which we will get to in just a moment, but Jay Book, the Buckeyes landed quarterback Quinn Ewers last night, the number one prospect in the country, regardless of position, in the 2022 class. The Buckeyes now have eight commitments in their 2022 class, young men that just finished their junior seasons in high school or currently finishing their junior seasons in high school. Quinn Ewers, South Lake, Texas, again, the number one overall player in the country, decommitted from Texas a few months ago. Now he is joining the new quarterback, you, with Ryan Day. Just your thoughts on Quinn Ewers committing to the Buckeyes, Jonah. Dave, I'm so fired up about this. I mean, the fact that you can go into the heart of Texas and pull the number one player out, especially at a, a position such as the quarterback, it, it bodes tremendously for the program. It really puts a positive national spotlight uh, once again on Ohio State's recruiting chops. And you look at this kid, a lot of people believe he's a, a, a generational type talent. You know, you're talking about another kid with the with the overall game as far as a, a Trevor Lawrence or a Justin Fields. That's how good people think he's going to be at the next level. What, what has to make Ohio State fans extremely excited is when you get a, a kid like this that that flips is going he's going to bring in other high-end prospects. The the five-star wide receiver out of Texas that Ohio State's on, he's already, you know, looking like he may be trending towards the Buckeyes. And at this point, it's just Ryan Day picking and choosing his quarterback uh room. The talent is absolutely stacked in there. You look at what what we got coming in as far as Kyle McCord and and you got the CJ Stroud and Jack Miller already there. At one point you know, we were we were a, a Tate Martell and a Gunner Hoke type of quarterback room. Now you look at what it is now; it's just absolutely spectacular, and it's a great day to be a Buckeye. It, it's the talent separation that you're seeing from Ohio State from everyone else. It's only going to continue to get wider. When when you look at what's happening up in Michigan, where they can't even develop their own guys at quarterback. Ohio State is stacking up four and five star guys left and right, begging to come and play in Ryan Day's offense. Yeah, and Quinn Ewers wouldn't matter if he was from Alaska watching his film and just how great he is. But the fact that he's from Texas and playing against the competition that he is and the fact that the Buckeyes continue to clean up in the state of Texas, which is as rich of a talent state as there is. Uh, in high school football, I mean, it's, you know, you got the big three with, you know, Florida, Texas, California, and whatever order. Um, it, they continue to out recruit the Longhorns in the state of Texas. It's mind boggling. Yeah. And, and the thing about it, Dave, is if you look at the recruiting rankings, you know, and I, you look at Baron Browning's class with a coup in them since then, what that that makes what five or six five stars a lot of people look at texas and think you know maybe lsu or alabama would be the major threat uh obviously oklahoma and texas a and no it's ohio state ohio state is going down and owning texas and tom herman for the top prospects it's unbelievable and the thing that you really have to like about the texas guys they have all played at Ohio State and been impact players. J.K. Dobbins is probably the the lowest rated Texas kid that they've come that they've landed. And look at you know what he did at Ohio State. He's a you know top three all time rusher. I'm not sure what the stats you know reflect, but J.K. Dobbins' career speaks for itself. And you look at Akuda, you look at Garrett Wilson, and you look at Ewers is coming in. Um, Baron Browning was another five star and. Ryan Watts is a guy that they're really high on that they think will be an uh, impact player here. And Ohio State continues to be a major thorn in Texas and Tom Herman's side. And I said it at the time that with viewers decommitting from Texas, to me, that was the writing on the wall for Tom Herman because as big as Texas is when it comes to recruiting, you can't lose a generational-type quarterback 
who is committed to you. It's one thing if you if you lose a running back or a wide receiver, offense lineman, but when you lose someone who's supposed to be the face of your program, who's supposed to give you uh, the the recruiting bump that you're looking for with the other kids to say, hey, okay, if Quinn Ewers believes in you, then this is something that I should also be taking a look at to see if I want to follow suit. But he flips there, tells you what the Texas locals feel about Tom Herman and the fact that he's going to Ohio State. It, it just sets the tone for that 2022 class because it's going to tell a lot of commits like, hey, you come to Ohio State, you will you will be on the big stage. You will play under the bright lights. You will have a shot at the NFL. And most importantly, it, it's, he puts out the bat signal for the rest of the high end Texas prospects that Ohio State are in on. Yeah, just absolutely fantastic news. And Ohio State has the number one class in the country so far in that 2022 class. And we're only about five weeks away from signing day for the 2021 class, the early signing period, which is when 95% or more of young men sign. And they're either going to have the number two or the number one class in the country for 2021. As I said, right now, number two, Alabama's a little bit in front of them, but Ohio State's still in on some Big time guys like JT Tuimolo Al and Emeka Ibuka and others. And if they can get those guys, Ohio State's going to finish with the number one class in 2021. And now with Quinn Ewers, he has vaulted them to the number one class so far in the country in 2022. Just fantastic news for Ryan Day and the Buckeyes. All right, switching gears Ohio State, Indiana, the clash tomorrow, high noon at the horseshoe. Buckeyes favored by 21. How do you think this game is going to play out, and what is your prediction for a final score? Yeah, I think it's going to be Ohio State's toughest game of the season. Indiana, they're playing with a lot of confidence right now. Uh, A lot of people believe that this is a legitimate top 15, top 10 type of uh, football team in Indiana. I think it's going to be a situation where Ohio State will definitely – need to put up points. I'm not sure uh, where our defense stands because the Rutgers game in the second half left a a bad taste in my mouth. I do think that if they play four quarters of football, Ohio State should handle Indiana, but there's a lot of things that needs to be ironed out on the defense, and it's been a while since we've seen Ohio State on the field, Um, but I truly believe establishing the, the line of scrimmage up front on both sides of the football ball will be key. Indiana will turn the football over. They will throw the ball up for grabs. It's just going to be about can Ohio State get pressure up front on the defensive line and when it comes to the offensive line, controlling the point of attack, meaning that they need to start moving bodies out of the way so that the running game can really get going because at the end of the day we can't expect Justin Fields to be a hero every single game, throwing for 80 80- 80% completions and throwing for 300 plus yards. He can do it. Don't, don't make no mistake about it. But as we start to head into December, the time is now to really get that running game started. Good points all the way around. Now give me a final score prediction, my man. Yeah, I, I, I'm going with Ohio State 48, Indiana 24. I just think this Indiana team is good enough to, to score some points here. But the way this offense is operating in the passing game, I don't think Indiana has the personnel to to check Chris Olave or Garrett Wilson. Those guys are a hundred hundred yard uh, game type of wide receivers any day of the week, and I just don't think Indiana has the horses to guard Garrett Wilson in the slot. So I look for this game to be a high scoring affair. I do think, like I said, Indiana will get some points up on the board. I don't think it will be enough. Our score is very similar, as it always seems to be. I don't think we've we've had the exact same score in any of our predictions this year, only now four of them, uh, including this one. But I'm going with 42-20, to 20, as I said on Wednesday's show. Buckeyes 42, Indiana 20. So we both have Ohio State winning by about the same margin. I have 22, you have 24. Again, they're favored by 21, so we have them barely covering. Yeah, I feel like Ohio State, obviously by the final score prediction, I don't think they're going to blow out Indiana, but I feel like Ohio State's going to control this game. You know, so they're not going to have to do things like run Justin Fields a lot. You know, if it's a close game in the fourth quarter, they're going to have to do things like that. But I tend to think they're going to control this game enough where they will not have to do that. I, I find one thing very interesting about this matchup. When you look at 
Now, presuming Ohio State doesn't have a rust factor, they've only played three games this year. They've had 57 practices, and they've only played three games so far, which is crazy. They're, they're averaging one game for every 19 practices. So there could be some rust. But let's say there's no rust for the sake of argument. Let's say they come out and they look good. Ohio State has had a week off to rest. They've had an extra week to prepare, maybe an extra week and a half, extra half a week to prepare for Indiana. They didn't have to play in a physical football game last week and risk injuries. Indiana, we know Thomas Allen's out for the season. Backup linebacker, the coach's son, but still a guy that was playing a lot. You know, he's almost playing starters, starter reps. Um, and there's probably other guys that are banged up that we don't even know about. Penix at one point got banged up in the game last week for Indiana. Penix looked like he was fine, though. My point is, where do you come down on that? Do you think that's a pretty big advantage for Ohio State? They were able to kind of just sit at home and rest up while Indiana had to play? Or do you maybe do you think maybe there, there could be some rust for the Buckeyes here? I would not be surprised if there is a, a little bit of rust. Um, as you mentioned, 57 practices can, and equivalent to three games, 19 per game is just a significant amount of practice time. After a while, you get sick of practicing against yourself. You can only do so much. You And, and the thing that Ryan Day mentioned was Indiana – has game momentum, meaning that they've put together, you know, three consecutive weeks of playing. And that that's something to be had because whenever you're getting into a groove, you're getting into a rhythm, you want to keep playing. I know a lot of times um, during the season, if a team is hot and they're playing some of their best football, if you can keep that momentum going, then that typically bodes well for you. But with this Ohio State team, um, the, the injury bug is something that – they've been able to avoid. So having guys, uh, I, I know they lost the corner, but just having guys healthy for the most part going into this game is big. Um, I just think with, with Ohio State's talent, it's going to overwhelm Indiana. They're going to be a tough competition. Uh, make no mistake about it, but the rest could play a factor early on. And I just think that at the end of the day, is going to be the Buckeyes prevailing here. And if you look at the Ohio State Buckeyes, they usually start extremely fast on teams. And it's usually the second half where you start to see them kind of take their foot off the gas. So that's going to be something I really will keep an eye out on here because this Indiana team, they will fight for four quarters. It's just a matter of can Ohio State start fast and finish strong. We might see the debut of Ohio State true freshman corner legend Cavazos tomorrow. Um, we will find out later today when Ohio State status report is released around 10 a.m. But I'll be surprised if Cavazos doesn't make his debut tomorrow. And here's why. Ryan Day is always you know, very close to the vest when talking about injuries. But he was asked about legend yesterday and you know he, he said almost everything except for he's definitely going to play you know he says he's back practicing he says he's looking good he said even before the knee injury for those that are wondering that haven't heard we've talked about it before on the show but Cavazos had a sprained knee and that's uh they're concerned at first it might be very serious turns out it wasn't uh but he still missed the first three games and who knows if he would have played against Maryland um but it sounds like he's going to play I mean Ryan Day said he's been practicing and he looks good and Again, reiterated that he looked really good before he got hurt. So that's going to be exciting. I'm not saying I don't think Legend Cavazos is going to come in here and be a savior or anything, but they need depth there, as you mentioned. We know who the starters are, Sean Wade and Seven Banks, but losing Cam Brown, who's you know was already playing a lot as that number three corner, that's a big loss right there. And you know they need as much depth as they can get there. Ryan Watts is a true freshman playing. Now, hopefully, we'll get a chance to see Legend Cavazos tomorrow. Yeah, it's... It is telling that Ryan Day is so upfront about his status and uh, the way he's looked because, you know, you, 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 you're part of these conference, these press conferences and they're really hush hush when it comes to injuries and, and guys coming back. So the fact that they're really giddy about him being back tells me that one, they absolutely need him because of the depth there. And it's obvious as you watch this Ohio State team, I still think that they can play better than what we saw. Um, and it's going to be the, to be determined how Kerry Combs play these guys because 
if you watch that Rutgers game, they were playing a lot of soft zone there, uh, giving up that that outside short throws, which uh, end up turning into chunk plays. But just getting the fresh legs, fresh body back is going to play big for them, especially with a guy that they're very excited about because I want to see him get on the field and play because it's all hands on deck when it comes to that secondary right now. Now, we all wondered. I shouldn't say we all did. I certainly did. I think you did. We all wondered if there was some gamesmanship at play last week with Maryland canceling the game against Ohio State. And it wasn't like the Big Ten coming in and mandating it had to be canceled. It sounds like Maryland went to the Big Ten and said, we want to cancel. And just like with what Wisconsin did for a couple of weeks, they were allowed to cancel, even though there was talk that, you know, maybe they were under the threshold that they could have played if they wanted to, which is a debate for a different day if teams should be able to do that. Uh, and a lot of people were wondering, were they just ducking Ohio State? I was wondering that. You were wondering that. Are they just ducking Ohio State? But now Maryland, Michigan State's been called off as well, which bad news there. Not only because we can't continue our conspiracy theories, but uh, it's just bad news anytime a college football game is canceled. Every time I see it, my heart drops a little bit because you just never know when it's going to be Ohio State. We got the bad news last week with Ohio State. Hopefully everything will be all systems go tomorrow, but you just never know. Um, but just your thoughts on that Maryland situation um, and that uh, their game against the Spartans got called off. Yeah, you, you don't want to see games getting canceled, period, because you feel for the kids who've put in the hard work and they want to see uh, their family and friends and you know community want to see those guys playing on the field. But as far as Maryland, a lot of the skepticism that was thrown their way is part of their own doing. They had zero transparency throughout the entire process. And if you follow some of the story, even the local people – and, and beat writers are saying they don't know what's going on, you know, with, with Maryland. They announced eight. They haven't announced if there's been a mass breakout or what. With the Big Ten policy, you know, those eight guys who were to miss the, the game against Ohio State will be out for three more weeks. We don't know if, if there's been another mass break. There's been uh, a lot of smoke and, and, and talk. I can't say if it's true or not, is that the, the county is in Maryland over there is also involved in determining if they're willing to let those guys play um, the team play. So that can play a factor there. You, you know, you know, Maryland is not going to come out and actually name specific individuals, but if there's a situation where let's say an offensive line room is wiped out because of COVID, that's information that should be shared to the public because, you know, you, you have Mike Loxley coming in last Thursday Friday or, or maybe it was this week saying that he's getting his guys ready to play against Michigan State so when you when you have the head coach saying that they're preparing as they're going to play you had the Maryland insiders board saying that earlier this week that they were pushing to to play the Michigan State game however they weren't clear to practice and that's why I probably believe leaning towards that's probably the reason why they're not playing this game is they haven't even been cleared to practice yet but if you look at the words of Loxley and their insiders they were they were preparing to play against Michigan State and we don't know why what the setback was and, and why the game was officially canceled because such of the lack of transparency. But if you're Michigan State, um, you know, you you will hope that if the Big Ten did the right thing, they will allow them to schedule out a conference opponent like the Pac-12 has decided to allow. But the Big Ten hasn't made any type of ruling on that, just that they can schedule games against other teams who are who may have game may have had Big Ten games canceled, but Maryland, you know, you you hope the kids get a, a speedy recovery and they can get back on the field next week. But the overall, just a lack of transparency created a lot of confusion with them. Yeah, I do like. I'm glad you pointed that out. I do like that the Big Ten has, you know, they've adjusted some rules on the fly. You know, like with the false positive, which never should have even been a rule. If, if it, it's determined it's a false positive, the young man should be able to play like Justin Hilliard, which they've now. Uh, amended that um, you know and you know I like the idea that if there's multiple Big Ten games called off two or more that you know if two teams 
you know, tested clean, but they just can't play because their opponents tested positive, that they can then play each other. I do like that. But then the problem for a team like Maryland or Michigan State this week, or Michigan State it would be, is nobody else has their game canceled so far. You're almost rooting for, if you're Michigan State, another game to get canceled so you'd have an opponent. So it's a mess, and you're right. The solution there would have been to allow Big Ten teams to schedule out-of-conference opponents, like Nebraska tried to when their game against Wisconsin got canceled with the Big Ten won't allow teams to do that, which I don't, you know, I disagree with that heavily. Another thing I disagree with, let's finish the show with this. Ohio State came out on Wednesday and said um, they're no longer going to allow family and friends of the players and coaches to be in the stadium. So now there's just going to be nobody there, no fans at all there. At least there was like 1,500 fans in the stands uh, for the first two Ohio State home game, you know, about – First two Ohio State home games, there was about a thousand, you know, for the Buckeyes and about five hundred for the visitors. Uh, and uh, this, to me, man, Jay Book, I don't know how you feel about this. This is just safety theater. Like, there, I, I just don't see how. And I take the virus seriously. I'm not one of these people that's like blowing off the virus at all. Um, but with fifteen hundred people, roughly, it might be even been a tick below that, spread out over a. 105 seat thousand, 100, 105 thousand seat stadium. That's an outdoor stadium and it just seems like it's safety theater. Is that really going to spread the virus that you're, you're going to have these family and friends there? So they're taking that away from them. The parents are upset about it. They're not making a huge stink about it, but they're very upset about it and they're disappointed. But just your thoughts on that situation. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I do think that this theater here, if you look at the size of the stadium and the amount of parents are there, just spread them out. I mean, you're outdoors. They're not going to be contracting the virus amongst each other and spreading it to the players. And the the parents are saying that whenever they see their kids, it's the thing that really highlights to them is just getting a wave and a blown kiss because it's not like they're gathering with the players post game because of the, how strict Ohio State currently is with making sure that it's only the players mingling with each other. I just find it uh, a lot of times to me, and I don't like to argue with people on social media, and I truly believe that the virus needs to be contained. But at the end of the day, we need to be looking at common sense policies here. Common sense says if you if you have a thousand people in a hundred thousand seat stadium, you can spread them all over the stadium and they're going to be hundreds of feet apart here. I just think it's an overreach right now. I know a lot of people are just tired of their their liberties uh, being restricted here, and no one's taking for granted the virus. No one's saying that there shouldn't be policies and procedures in place, but at the end of the day, use common sense here. If you follow Monica Johnson, um, you know, Paris Johnson's mother, Cameron Babs mother, all of these family members and, and uh, G. Scott Jr.'s father, they're devastated because they, they say this is what we're looking forward to. They've sacrificed a significant amount because they can't see their kids. They can't go and give their kids a hug and a kiss um, right now because of the sacrifices that they're making. They know that these kids want to play football and they're on the hunt for a national championship. And the fact that you're now taking it away from the parents that they can't see them live and for the kids too, you know, it's frustrating. And as a parent myself, I would want to want to be there for my kid watching them play. What if one of my kids get hurt or if my kid gets hurt in the game and I'm not there and I'm watching it on TV and they're willing to cart out there to pick up my son on the field. I want to be at least, you know, somewhere in the vicinity. So I know what's going on with them. But it's a policy of the county, and it looks like Ohio State is just following the rules and the regulations from the county. But like I said, we just need to use common sense here. Hopefully, they will lift the restrictions by the Michigan game so that a lot of these seniors who are going to be walking out uh, on that field for their very last time, at least their parents can be in the stands to see them for that game. Yeah, absolutely. Good point there. Great stuff all around from Jonah Booker. Thank you very much, Jay Book. And thank you to all the listeners out there for tuning into the show. We appreciate it very much. Enjoy the game tomorrow, Bucknutters. <laughs>